Hello everyone and thank you for joining us. My name is Jen Northington and I'm the events director for Word, a bookstore here in Brooklyn. And we're very lucky today to have three authors with us for this special Google Hangout set up in partnership with Hashat Book Group. Joining me are Paolo Bacigalupi. Hey. Lauren Bukis. Hi. And Jesse Bullington. Hello. And we're going to talk about their books, science fiction and fantasy and horror as a genre, or several genres, and anything else that comes up in the next uh, hour. So, um, oh, and if you have questions, um, you can put them on the comments on the event on our Google Plus page, or um, tweet them at us, and we will try to get to them. Um, so uh, to start the ball rolling, um, this is a question for all three of you. Uh, you all seem to have a bit of a favorite place to be in your books. Um, Jesse is medieval Europe. Paolo is an ecologically slash genetically disastrous near future. And um, Lauren, you tend to inhabit these really uh, thematically rich urban environments. So I was wondering if you could each take a moment to tell us um, kind of the source of your fascination with those go-to places. And um, uh, Jesse, let's start with you. Uh, well, for me, I guess it comes down to always being a bit of a history nerd. Uh, I was pretty young when I kind of made that correlation between stories and history. Like, I always loved stories. And in school, I must have been middle school or early high school, where it kind of occurred to me, as you do as you're growing up, that I actually have a favorite subject. And it's not even English. I, I love reading, but I was never very big on uh, things like grammar. So as some of my critics probably are fond of pointing out. At any rate, uh, medieval Europe, I think, really took a hold of me when I was fortunate enough as a kid to live in Holland for about nine months. And we took some travels over the summer to you know medieval castles and stuff like that. And that, I think, never really let go of me. And so when I started writing fiction, uh, actually, the first real novel I completed was set in feudal Japan, and it was terrible. It was really, really bad, and I scrapped it and kind of went back to something that I was a little bit more intimately familiar with, which was medieval Europe, and again, uh, that was the sad tale of the Brothers Grosspart, my first book, and I've been really, really fortunate enough since to kind of be able to keep playing in that sandbox. So I'm really excited to write about cities. I think partly that's because the great South African novel often comes down to, uh, you know, the great pastoral and like one one man's journey into the rural interior to discover the in interior of his soul. And I find cities just exciting. There's this clash of cultures. There's a clash of people and intersecting uh, technology and magic and just everything comes together in cities and I find that incredibly exciting. I find it an amazing, uh, energizing space. Um, and especially in South Africa, you know, you have 11 national languages, you have just this range of people coming together, you have refugees coming in from the Cameroon and from Ghana and from Zimbabwe. And to have all that stuff happening in one space, it just feels alive. It feels like the heart and soul of the country. Um, I think for me, actually, I, I ended up writing in this space mostly because of my fears. Uh, I've had this sort of ongoing sort of fascination with the idea about what trends matter and trying to figure out which trends matter, which trends are going to have big impacts in the future. And, and, and for some reason, I always sort of seem to focus on the worst case scenario. And it's just sort of an obsession. And so writing is sort of a process for me to sort of sort of work through some of those sort of moments where I think maybe this isn't going to go so well for us and then I can sort of like sort of get that out of myself and so I end up in these broken worlds but it's also sort of therapeutic for me to sort of move that outside of my head and onto the page. Yeah it seems like a lot of genre fiction you're just extrapolating something to the nth degree and seeing where it leads you um, so so it seems like the, you know, the technology, obviously, for Lauren and Paolo, that plays a big role for you two. And then Jesse, it's more, is it more, is it right to say that it's more of sort of those social mores about history that are, that are fascinating? Oh, you're muted, I think. Ah, sorry, yeah, I wanted to make sure I didn't clink my teacup while Paolo was you're, talking. You were being so good about it, too. I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, in terms of the historical aspect, I think really what kind of captivated me and drew me was the fact that it is, 
you know, often when we think of fantasy, we do think of second world, often quasi-medieval, but the reality of the historical record is one of ambiguity and one of the fantastic kind of, you know, these narratives we have, even when we're not taking into account things like bestiaries, are very much informed by this sort of romantic, dramatic scope. And so I think when I first started sitting down thinking like, well, I'd like to do something fantastical, <clears throat> excuse me, I initially thought, well, I'll probably do something, you know, second world, but then the more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know, real history is so rich with possibility that that is really kind of where I wanted to go, especially since so much of the historical fiction I was reading, because I do like a lot of historical fiction, does take a kind of mundane approach to things. They really, you know, you'll have uh, some really great books, but there are, you know, for every Umberto Eco, there's a dozen sort of lesser authors who really don't kind of scratch much more than the su surface. So I'm hoping to try to do that. And as you were saying with social mores, kind of tap into the unexplored social issues that we really don't see represented as much in historical fiction. So that's kind of why, you know, each successive book has kind of tackled a different corner of, uh, you know, unrepresented or underrepresented portions of history and the people that live there. I think it's really interesting that point about history. Um, you know, I worked as a journalist for a very long time. That was my kind of former job, my former life. And um, I've often found that the real world is more surprising and more inventive than anything you can make up. And, um, you know, I had, I had a couple of researchers working with me on The Shining Girls, which is about a time-traveling serial killer in Chicago. And I sent one of my researchers, Adam Maxwell, off to get information about 1930s hospitals, how much they charged, how, how they would treat a ripped tendon, um, what the doctors wore, what the hospitals actually looked like. And he came back with all that information, including eBay links if I wanted to buy any creepy medical equipment from the 1930s, which was awesome. Um, but he also included a really weird article about an, a radium dancer in 1936. And it was a young woman who performed burlesque, um, painted in radium paint. And it was just so crazy and so amazing that I absolutely had to make part of the novel. And I think what I love about your work is where you pick up on those threads of history. Um, and where I'm thinking, did he make this up? Is this real? And, you know, it, it's fantastic. It's really exciting. Um, and I think it makes your worlds richer. Yeah, there's something actually interesting about that in terms of mining, even for future, you know, sort of science fictional writing that uh, I found that, like, a lot of times people say, oh, this world feels very lived in, it's very alive, it's very, you know, whatever, and, and it almost invariably it's because I was stealing details from, from our present world and sort of rehashing those. I'd remix them, certainly, but they're, they're, they're drawn from very specific instances. It's not my imagination at all. It's the, the sort of research and mining and running across odd objects that are already exist and then sort of repurposing them into, into the story that, that sort of ge generates that sort of verisimilitude. Yeah, I had noticed that about your books in particular, Paolo, is that, and well, actually, in some of the stuff in Moxieland, um, Lauren, that the technology is actually not far fetched at all. Some of it is here right now, and some of it is only a step or two away, which I think is what um, is one of the things that's so exciting about reading those books is that, you know, you can play with those consequences in a way that you can't while, well, you know, the drugs are the, of the, or the technology is still in beta testing and at DARPA. <laughs> Definitely, but I think, I think what's interesting about that is that you've got to be very careful as well. Um, you know, you can't be too on the money. Because there's some stuff you can't predict. I mean, Moxieland doesn't have anything vaguely resembling Twitter. And I'm like, ah, oh, how could I have not have predicted Twitter? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, but it's, um, I, I was talking to William Gibson about this the other day, and he was talking about, um, you know, how you need to play with the liminal spaces. You need to make stuff up. You need to, you need to play and extrapolate and not try and tie it too closely to what's happening in the real world, because then you will get bust. You will get caught out. So I don't know how you deal with that, Paolo. No, it's just, well, it's just that thing is you're, you're taking the, the initial object and then you're going to twist it in some way and make it, you know, and sort of adapt it to its local circumstance. It's future local, you know, that, that, that idea. Yeah. So that there's, so it's still got the width of history to it and that gives it its weight sort of, but then by, by, you know, adapting it to the specific moment, that's, um, I remember it, the, my current book, The Drowned Cities, is all about uh, child soldiers. And one of the things that uh, I was doing a bunch of research about weaponry and things, and I follow a, a journalist named C.J. Chivers, who's 
uh, wrote a book called AK-47, uh, The Gun, and it's all about the history of the AK-47. And he has a blog as well. And one of the things I was on his blog at one point and saw he had photographs of um, AK-47s that uh, had been found in Afghanistan, and they were painted. Um, they'd been decorated. And you sort of looked at that and went, that's interesting. There's, a, there's an interesting detail that people are decorating their weapons. And then to grab that detail and drag it into the drowned cities where I have these different factions. There's the Army of God. There's the United Patriot Front. And then how did they decorate their weapons, and what's their personal connection to a gun that has a long history. It's been it's been around since America was actually functional and it's still been passing from hand to hand. And what does that look like? So you've got that detail from somewhere else and then you sort of adapt to that local circumstance and that, that sort of makes the world feel very rich and real as well. And the, the, the object when they pick it up is no longer just a gun. The gun has personality in itself too. And, and uh, Jess, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm totally interrupting. Um, it was really interesting, <laughs> sorry, with the, um, with the Enterprise of Death. I mean, that was a real artist that you were that you used. Right? Absolutely, yeah. And um, Dr. Paracelsus is, uh, I think, probably the most over-the-top character in the book. And everything that I have of him that is really, really out there and Gonzo, you know, aside from the fantastical stuff, was based on accounts of him. And I've read a, a couple of different books, and you know, some people take a kind of more uh, literal approach to some of the stories around him. But yeah, no. Um, Nicholas Manuel Deutsch in The Enterprise of Death, Dr. Paracelsus, uh, and then in uh, Gross Barts and Folly, also the books on the other side of it, again, I kind of used historical personages, and in a lot of ways, as Lauren was saying, you find that the real history is really kind of takes hold because it is so much richer than anything I could really come up with. And uh, in terms of getting back to what you guys were talking about with not trying to commit yourself too firmly to ideas and technologies when you're doing sort of future spec. It's the same thing with the historical record, obviously, where you have to ask yourself that question of how accurate can I possibly make this? And I'm way more obsessive about it than <laughs> uh, is probably good for me. I've definitely done 11th hour revisions because I found out that, you know, like, well, anchors would have been on the other side of the ship during this era. Uh, gross parts was this huge headache because I realized at the last minute that I had them riding into Venice in the 14th century. I was like, there is actually a lot of water between them. So I had to like, you know, completely rewrite a section of the book. But I think really the thing that we all have in common, or one of the things we have in common, other than, you know, dashing good looks and brilliant, you know, wit, is this sort of engagement with reality, even though we are doing spec, you know, there is that sort of idea that, well, science fiction, fantasy, whatever you want to call it, is escapism. And I think there is a lot of escape there, but I think there's also a lot of engagement. I think the best stuff really does engage. Uh, the Folly of the World, although it takes place in the 15th century and it's about this historical catastrophic flood in Holland, I can't imagine I would have written that if I hadn't grown up in the panhandle of Florida. Uh, and that's really kind of neat because right now I'm reading Shipbreaker and seeing how Paolo is also kind of dealing with these Gulf Coast, real like, you know, playing with things that have happened and also speculating, I think, very <laughs> interestingly for someone who lived there for so long. I think, you know, you do a great job, Paolo, of kind of going where I think, unfortunately, <laughs> things might go. Uh, and, you know, this was, you know, forget about even the deep water incident, uh, Deep Horizon. There was also, you know, Katrina, everything else that is in that area. It's a really neat, rich area. And so it's kind of fascinating to think that, you know, two authors, without ever having talked about it, you know, are kind of tapping into this similar location as a kind of, I don't know if that was, you know, the main source of inspiration for you or not, Paolo, but it feels like, it feels like a sort of book that although it could be set a lot of different places, the Gulf Coast setting for me feels incredibly just real. That book actually came alive when it, when I finally figured out that it was going to be on the Gulf Coast. Originally, I actually thought I'd set it on the coastal Northeast and, and that was the original spot for it. And, for a variety of reasons it didn't work and when I finally got managed to get it placed and it suddenly you know and partly it was things like Katrina that had sort of centered me in and I was like oh this is actually a great way to sort of be embedded in a larger set of ideas without ever even necessarily having to bring them you know specifically onto the page oh here's global warming oh here's sea level rise oh here's violent storms whatever those things are they're just there it's just the environment and so it's like oh this it, it pops automatically almost and, that actually um, 
brings us to something I wanted to talk about. Jesse, you mentioned the engagement with current issues and um, politics and technology. One of the things that I feel as a reader, I am most, um, is one of the things I like a lot about your books, uh, all three of you, is that you deal a lot with these moral ambiguities. So, um, you know, when you have fantasy like Tolkien, where the lines are really clearly drawn, you know exactly who's good, you know exactly who's bad, you know exactly why they're good and why they're bad. Um, and it doesn't really engage in any of the gray areas, um, whereas I think a lot of current fantasy, sci-fi and horror, and you three definitely, I mean, Jesse, I don't know if any of your characters has ever had a moral compass, um, which is part of why I love them. Um, <laughs> and, um, but so I was wondering if the three of you could talk a little bit about, you know, engaging, it was like, Lauren, you've written now a serial killer, you know, time travel mystery, and and Paolo, your your characters are in some very like survival of the fittest situations, um, and so I wonder how you handle those, how you how you, do you struggle with you know them making the right or the wrong decisions? Lauren, like right, you're up. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I like to see my characters struggle. I like to see them you know mess up. I like to see them be human and have flaws and make mistakes. And sometimes it's frustrating. You know, in Moxieland, we have this really hardcore activist and his heart is absolutely in the right place, but he's blinded by his temper. And there are points where you want to strangle him. You're like, what are you doing? How can you not see what is actually going on? But I couldn't let him off the hook either. Um, and I think that was, that, that was really fun to play with. It was, it was frustrating as well, but, you know, I couldn't let him off the hook. I had to let him be true to himself. Um, Zoo City was all about reconciliation. It was about how you live with the past, how you live with something terrible that you've done. And that was directly informed by South Africa and this kind of gray moral area we have where we live through this horrendous regime, the apartheid regime. Uh, you know, deeply racist, fundamentally messed up this country. We're living with that legacy now. And it's going to take decades to recover. And how do you, how do you come to terms with that? How do you reconcile yourself with that? And how do you come to terms with the bad thing that you've done personally. I was very interested in crime and criminals um, and having a very flawed character. And a lot of people come and tell me that my characters are very unlikable. And I'm like, well, I don't know if they're unlikable. I just think they have problems. Um, you know, and, and, but a lot of, you know, I, I also get the response that people kind of like them by the end or that they see them through the journey. Um, and in, in The Shining Girls, it's, it's much more about vengeance. It's about a woman whose life has become derailed by the fact that she had this horrendous attack on her, but she survived, and she's not going to let it go. And it's, it's actually destroying her entire life. If she could find a way to get over it, then she would be okay. But she can't. And I think that reflects my interest in violence against women in general, um, and how are we supposed to let this kind of stuff go? Um. Jesse, you have really crazy characters. I mean, like, you know... Your characters have some real moral issues. They're, they're, they're great. They're really fun. And you know what? They're really super feminist. I mean, you gave me crazy sympathy for a necromantic rapist. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, in the case of Enterprise, uh, yeah, the whole... That, and that's one thing that I honestly am not, even to this day, feel very conflicted about was the, uh, you know, treatment of Awa, the main character in Enterprise. There is real no real world analog. There's a situation where she feels like there is a consensual act taking place, but after the fact it turns out that maybe it wasn't as consensual. And that's really as close as I'd ever want to get to sexual violence just because it squeaks me out beyond belief. And, you know, so in her case, I think she's probably my, one of my more sympathetic characters, really, because she doesn't, you know, I would never really want to have any sort of protagonist that would voluntarily do anything like that. And I think, again, one of the problems of that particular uh, character's conflicted emotional state is she's in the situation where there really isn't any real-world analog for that. Uh, whereas someone like the Grossbarts in the first book, who are just kind of dyed in the wool, dyed in the beard, bad guys. Uh, but to me, bad guys were always more interesting, you know, if you follow that old chestnut of, you know, the villain is always the hero of her, his own story. And so for these characters, I really wanted to, again, you mentioned moral compass, Jen. I think they do have a moral compass. It's just maybe their definition of North is a little bit different from most people's. Uh, they definitely have things that they wouldn't do and lines that they wouldn't cross. And at the end of the day, they're just kind of trying to 
do well for themselves, which, uh, not to take, you know, too dark a view of humanity, but I think that's a kind of much more realistic portrayal. I think that's part of the reason why I, you mentioned, the, you know, Tolkien and his black and white morality, and I think part of the reason I've always enjoyed The Hobbit more than The Lord of the Rings is that The Hobbit is, although a children's book, much more into shades of gray, and the scope and the scale is much more petty. Uh, Bilbo's a fop. He just wants to hang out, and then when he's kind of dragged into this situation, he does some kind of shady things, and the dwarves are definitely very greedy individuals. There's none of the, you know, fate of mankind, true good versus true evil that you see in Lord of the Rings. So even the scale and the scope is so much larger there, it kind of is a less nuanced book because it's not about real people. Because to me, real people, I mean, you know, that's the issue, like, again, talking about things that there's no real-world anal uh, analogy. There's no real-world analog for orcs, like an evil race. There, just, there aren't. Like, individuals are individuals. And I think that's what kind of I try to get across, is that although these characters might be very flawed, uh, you know, I like the idea of kind of putting readers in the position of making decisions for themselves whether or not is this character justifiable to me as someone I could like, you know, Walter White and Breaking Bad, for example, these characters that you either love to hate or you kind of sympathize or empathize with them enough that by the end of the day, you may not <laughs> agree with the choices they've made, but you still want to see them find some sort of peace for themselves. And I think I've done your book a disservice. I mean, uh, Enterprise of Death, you have a lot of sympathy for Awa, and she's an incredible character. And it's an act of love, and it's an act of loneliness. And you bring that through really beautifully. Um, and, you know, I think you, you write some of the best female characters I've seen. It's really fantastic. So just in case I put anyone off of that description. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Thank you, Lauren. I appreciate it. <laughs> Paolo, I think you're in the hotspot. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just muted and spacing out. No, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I actually was admiring how you've actually taken over as journalist and started interviewing and sort of directing things. It's just, it's I know, fabulous. I'm sorry. No, you're, you're a rock star. It's awesome. <laughs> it's, um, uh, I, I actually wanted to go back to something that you said about how your readers react to the characters and how they say, um, oh, this is a very unlikable character. And, and I've gotten that a, a number of times, and it's always really puzzling to me because the, you know, somebody will say, oh, this character is really unlikable. And I think how much empathy I typically have for my characters as I'm writing them. And, and it's, it's not that they're bad people, it's that I put them in horrible circumstances. And, and it's, it's interesting to me because I, I guess, I, I'm not sure whether it's just you've read too much or you've seen too many people who go through difficult times or what, but I don't know. The, the moral compass seems far more sort of flexible and, and, and complex than simply right or wrong. And I think sometimes, like, especially in genre fiction, there's, for some reason there's an expectation that, that the characters must choose that righteous path. And if they're doing anything other than that, that they, they're, they're unlikable. They're not good people. And it's like, no, they're wonderful people. They're just struggling. And... Um, and, and, and I think that, you know, the, the, if there, if there's anything that's unlikable, it's that I've created a world for them that's horrifying and it's not the, it's not the characters themselves that are doing anything wrong at all. They're, they're simply reacting and trying to survive in the space that I put them. Um, I always wonder about that actually, what it says about us and our empathy for other people and their decisions and the situations that they're in and what, what motivates us to do something that, that doesn't look palatable according to some, you know, uh, you know sort of rigid moral code, but, but, but makes a lot of sense from a perspective of survival or simply having two bad choices and having to choose one no matter what. Um, so anyway. Well, I think that's what's really interesting. Sorry, Jen. No, I'm that's sorry. okay. You go, go ahead. Well, you know, I think that's what's very interesting about fiction is, um, is its ability to create empathy, is that you are stepping into someone's shoes, you are stepping into someone's experience in their lives, uh, and even that, if that's fictional, the whole point is to try and create empathy, uh, to, to suck someone in. So I think that's a really good point, Paolo. And uh, Paolo, that, I have a question about that, actually, because you write across age lines. Um, you've got right. um, a middle reader uh, book coming out soon, The Zombie Baseball Beatdown. Yes. Um, <laughs> I just got my galley. I'm very excited about that. And then awesome. Dark Cities and um, Shipbreaker are YA, and Wind Up Girl is, I think, technically adult. Um, so you know, you've kind of handled these. Uh, and Pump Six, right, is a is a collection. As an adult. Yeah. Yes, and so you've you've got these, you know, sort of across all the age lines. Do you do you approach writing those 
those issues differently, or does it all kind of feel the same, or how does that how does that translate? Um, it's it. Uh, it, it turns out that um, the issues for me actually seem to remain the same, uh, regardless of the. And I was that's sort of a surprise. Like when I was writing Zombie Baseball Beatdown, I originally uh, started writing that because there was a, a boy in uh, one of my wife. My wife is a school teacher, and there was a boy in her school who. Um, was uh, disinterested in reading, and and finally, in sort of a fit of desperation, she's like, "Well, what would you want to read about?" And uh, and he says, "Zombies." And I was like, "Well, fuck it, I can write you a zombie book." And uh, oh, there's my there's my cursing. Um, but uh, it was interesting because uh, as as I started to write it, it was originally just written as a as a gift of sort of splatter for a you know for a middle grade kid. You know, you get to see some. Zombies zombies wandering around and you get to beat them up with baseball bats and and then it became an uh, an issues and ideas book for me as well and things like immigration and things like um, you know meat packing plants and food safety and stuff became involved in that um, and it was sort of uh, it was sort of a surprise to me to sort of see those themes wind their way in uh, when I thought I was just sort of trying to write some fun splatter for a kid and it turns out no no I'm still here doing my thing um, in terms of like actual other shifts though the, the biggest probably it, it's there are there are some detail shifts and so like certainly drowned cities is far more aggressive than anything that, that happens in in zombie baseball but uh, the tone shifts you know where where you know both of them have action and, and killing and destruction and stuff but, but when you're reading the the middle grade zombie baseball it's it's a uh, it's it's adventurous um, and similarly shipbreaker was adventurous as well whereas drowned cities is horror um, there's there's action, but it's all horror, really, and uh, and Wind Up Girl is horror as well. I actually think though that uh, Drowned Cities is probably the most um, intense of the books that I've actually written. It's far more intense than Wind Up Girl, it turned out, which was interesting to me because Wind Up Girl was the adult, a theoretically adult book, and uh, and Drowned Cities is the one that sort of still like sort of gets me when I read it. I'm like, this is heavy. <laughs> so why did it turn out that way? Sorry. Why did it turn out? that way uh, I think I think it was the subject matter um, I think that when when I started write, working on drowned cities uh, just because I started working with child soldiers I was really interested in the idea of political collapse and sort of like um, sort of the degradation of, of political values down to that level where you're you know throwing your young into into your your political fights and things and uh, but it turns out like you, you once, once you've sort of sufficiently degraded a society to the point where they're using their children uh, as their cannon fodder and as their as their sort of war fodder, um, uh, so many different things are broken in your society that it becomes it rapidly becomes horrific. And uh, I think that the the thing with drowned cities actually ultimately was that the research that I did with drowned cities um, meant that I was it was it was very, very difficult to actually craft a narrative that made sense um, because. Uh, all of the war narrative stuff that seems to come out of um, any place where there's child soldiering, it's just tragedy. There's no, there's no arc. There's no, there's no journey. There's no, yeah, the, the kids should just die on the first page and they should be done. Um, and if they aren't dead on the first page, they should be dead on the 10th page. And if they aren't dead on the 10th page, they should be maimed by the 50th page. You know, and so like just trying to keep the characters even alive and moving through the story uh, was, it was a fight against falseness in a lot of ways because, um, because you, you know that your source material is saying, nope, they're dead now. Nope, they're dead now. Nope, they're dead now. And, and that was, um, and so you're, you're fighting against that sort of the, the, the just the, the grimness of the source material. And that's, you could never get away with that, get away from it. And you don't want to, you want to, you want to sort of, you want to be honest with what, what you've, you know, done your research with, and you want that to be injected into it. But um, at the same time, you're sort of fighting with this, the, the, the unnatural structure of needing a story that comes to some purpose. Um, and that's what narrative is, is it's supposed to have some arc. There's supposed to be some journey. Um, it's not supposed to end abruptly and pointlessly. Um, and so that was uh, an interesting sort of puzzle for me for a long time. And, you know, I sort of felt like the characters were always just barely getting through. And, yeah. Jesse, that um, leads me to a question I had for you about this new uh, con this conversation that's going on um, about grimdark in fantasy. Have you been following this? I'm uh, very curious as to your take on it. A little bit. Uh, frankly, the, part of the problem, honestly, is that I'm really not as up on 
modern second world fantasy that I probably should be. I read really slowly, and that makes me very skittish of embarking on long series, especially those that are still in progress. So I've read uh, a bunch of Joe Abercrombie, which I, I really love. I, I mean, you know, there's some warts, but I think he's really smart, and I think he's really nailing it. And then again, I've also kind of, you know, been really turned off by other things. To me, I guess it comes down to whether or not stuff is there to be gratuitous or not. Like, uh, again, kind of getting back to what we were talking about a little bit earlier in terms of personal boundaries and being really not interested in writing a lot of stuff with sexual violence, I think that's one thing that modern fantasy just from what I've seen excerpted and stuff I've actually come across and, you know, not to bash anyone by name, but particular authors definitely kind of make it seem like in pre-industrial societies, rape was this thing that was, you know, as common as, you know, eating a meal or something and it's not a big deal and it happens all the time. And it's just a really simplistic and wrong kind of view, you know, it drives me nuts and isn't anything that, you know, seems to exist for any purpose other than to, be a signifier that like, oh, this is a brutal society and this is a brutal land. And with violence, it's the same sort of thing where it's this, uh, if not fetishization, at least this sort of like video game or action movie, violence, 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 without any real purpose uh, other than to titillate maybe. And obviously, you know, maybe it sounds funny for me to say that because obviously my books do have a lot of sex and they do have a lot of violence. But one thing that I try to do is keep it very realistic. Uh, I think violence should be shocking, and so that's maybe a little problematic when people dismiss violence or, you know, any kind of content is like, oh, it's there for shock value. Well, violence should be shocking. It's really terrible and horrific, and I think for a long time in fantasy, you had violence romanticized in the sense of, like, you know, these sword fights where there's hardly ever a drop of blood hitting the ground versus being, you know, down and dirty, horrible fights for survival between two living animals. And so in terms of the larger grimdark conversation, which I know I've kind of drifted away from, I guess to me it comes down to what authors are trying to do and how well they're achieving them, which are obviously two different things. Uh, I know that although maybe my stuff could be classified as such, the darkness is there because that's the sort of darkness I see in the modern world and the kind of darkness I see in the historical record and unfortunately the sort of violence that I see in the future. So for me... Any sort of conversation that calls these things out for having, you know, over-the-top violence or sexual violence are conversations we need to be having because, you know, anytime someone is writing something, they're thinking about it, and maybe in some cases people should be thinking a little bit more. I think that's a really interesting point. You know, writing The Shining Girls, I was writing about a serial killer, and I don't, I don't have a long-term fascination with serial killers. It's not my thing. Um, I listened to a lot of podcasts about serial killers while I was on the treadmill, which is really good incentive. You do not need a personal trainer. You just need to listen to podcasts about serial killers. Um, but it was really important to me in the book to get violence right. You know, and the violence is brutal. It's, it's horrible. But because, as you said, violence should be shocking. It should be horrific. We should know the real impact of what violence does. And it makes me think of a, a scene in the movie The Craze uh, from back in the 1990s, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And there's a moment where they slit someone's throat, and I don't think you even see it, but you just hear the rasp of the blade on the throat, and it's just so horrible. And that's what I wanted to get as, as composed, you know, compared to Tarantino and like really cartoonish hyper violence, which is fun. Um, but that's not what I want to do in my fiction. I want I want you to feel it. I want you to feel the horror, the reality, the tragedy, the loss, um, and for it not to be gratuitous. For, for to show the impact of what it does to us personally and the ripples it sends through societies. Uh, it was really important to me to try and get that right, and I hope I pulled it off. Yeah, well, it's like the distinction you're making, both of you, and I, um, I think it's very valuable, the difference between something that's shocking and something that's gratuitous, right? Because something, if we're not desensitized to violence, which hopefully we shouldn't be more than we already are, yeah. um, it, it should be, it should take us aback. Um, but that doesn't mean that it has to happen on every page. Paolo, do you have any? Well, I think that, I, I think that the, the, the thing that sort of stands out a lot of times when people are talking about, you know, sort of the grim dark thing, and, and, and for me it's the grim meat hook future, um, is, the, is the term that gets thrown at me. Um, 
is is that there is this sort of there's a judgment that goes along with it, which says that this author, it, why is this author doing this thing to me? And then, and there's sort of a split moment where you can either say. I think that this author is doing these things for gratuitous purposes, or I believe that this author has a purpose, and and it's clearly outlined in the text that it's not simply, you know, sort of a, a wank over whatever horrifying thing that the author has created. And uh, and 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 I think that there are there are on on one level that's that is a question of like what details did they choose, what where did they choose to focus their camera, things like that. But there is this other part where I also feel like there, in some cases, you just have a question of whether or not the reader is actually even willing to give um, the writer the benefit of the doubt that there might be a purpose and that this is not, in fact, you know, just because they, they find it unpleasant doesn't necessarily mean that it's gratuitous and that those things sometimes get overlapped in interesting ways. It's like, I don't like this, therefore it's gratuitous. It's like, well, maybe. Um, and and so that's that's sort of the interesting thing. I, I see both of those those sort of terms where somebody says, oh, that's grim dark fantasy. And it's like, well, it might be worth like sort of exploring a little bit more, a little bit further to sort of make that decision or that assessment. And and in some cases, perhaps that's you know you know the the exact uh, you know critique that should be leveled at it, just like grim meat hook futures. But um, at least for me with science fiction, that I, I know that there are very specific reasons why I'm creating a world that's broken. And, and a lot of times it seems like it's a way for people to dismiss the idea that there is a reasonable cascade there that I've created and that, that this is, you know, that it's, this did proceed from some first principles that, that then went down. And they don't, may not like those first principles, but that those first principles were conceived of as it, just, just for the giggle. Um, you know that you know I'm sitting around like sort of saying, yeah, here I'm going to create another shitty future. I love spending time here. It's not that's not the case. In fact, I'd rather write something that's more fun. So, um, you know, that's that's sort of the thing where I've reacted. Sort of, I'm like, you think I am enjoying this? I hate this. <laughs> like, uh, um, and that's sort of interesting to sort of see that you know that sort of like immediate lab label go on to something just because it's an unpleasant experience to see it. So. Yeah, and I think Paolo is absolutely right, and kind of it's something that I've noticed definitely in reviews of my own work, and also I, I'm sure everyone has kind of had that happen where those elements suddenly overshadow everything else, which is really disappointing when you spend all of this time incorporating this material for a very definite point or to make several points or just, again, to kind of convey the world that these things are happening in, and people, certain readers, can't get past one particular scene or one particular aspect of it and then dismiss the whole work based on the visceralness of something that maybe, you know, I've seen people dissect works, my own and others, based on, you know, a single paragraph. And that single paragraph overshadows everything else that they might have to say. So I think, again, just kind of playing off of what Powell was saying, it is kind of unfortunate that I mean, obviously, as writers, when we're talking to readers, we're talking to them through the page. And so I try to make a point to never, like, you know, argue with critics about, like, no, you missed the whole point. It wasn't just gratuitous. It wasn't this. It wasn't that. But having read both Paolo and Lauren's work, you know, I, I can't imagine that that criticism would ever be leveled. But, of course, it is. So. Well, lest we get too bogged down in violence, um, I want to go back to something we were talking about earlier. <laughs> it's a really good discussion, but I, you know, um, we talked a little bit about research earlier, and I know you guys all do extensive amounts of research. I'm wondering if there's anything that um, that you like found that you haven't been able to use yet, and you're like hanging on to it, and you just can't wait to get it in, but it just hasn't found its home yet. Like obviously, the radium dancing girls, Lauren and Shining Girls, is such an interesting tidbit, but there had to have been tons of things that came up for all of you. There were so many amazing things. It was so <laughs> frustrating. I wanted to die. Um, you know, my, my friend Peter Smith wrote this incredible book called Doomsday Men, which is about the uh, the real live Dr. Strangeloves. Um, and it's just amazing. And, and how the first nuclear fission happened under Chicago University, the University of Chicago. And I so badly wanted to get that in, and I just couldn't. I had this whole chapter on um, a young architect who's accused of being a dirty commie under McCarthyism in the 50s. And I desperately tried to just shovel in that nuke reference, and I, I just couldn't. It was just too painful. But um, I think the best example I actually have is when I was writing Zoo City, and I went to Hillbrow, which is in the inner city of Johannesburg, and it's um, a lot of people see it as kind of a very dilapidated area, very kind of... Um, 
it's a slum. It used to be very cosmopolitan. But it's also, you know, what I wanted to get at was where, that it's also somewhere people live. It's a real place. It's it's not just the place of TV specials and, and breathless documentaries where Louis Theroux is kind of hiding out um, behind a camera crew who is storming up the, the building. Um, so I went to the Central Methodist Church, which was a place in Johannesburg where a lot of refugees were taking shelter. In 2008, when I was researching the book, there were xenophobic attacks where black South Africans attacked black Africans. Um, and, it, it, you know, it's very complicated. It has to do with poverty and politics um, and people trying to put the blame on others. And the Central Methodist Church was somewhere where about 5,000 refugees were taking shelter, um, the same way apartheid activists took shelter during, during the war against apartheid. And I went into this place, and it was the most shocking place I've ever been. It was, it was harrowing. There were, you know, we, we walked down the stairs. There was, we attended the church service, me, myself and a fixer, who was kind of my bodyguard and translator and guide. And we spoke to a, a nurse who was dressed immaculately in a white linen suit among all these people who were very sick and cell phones ringing and people coughing up sput sputum. A lot of people had tuberculosis. Um, and she asked us if we, want, if we wanted to come and see where she slept. So we walked downstairs. We pushed through this throng of bodies into pitch blackness. People were trying to find somewhere to sleep on the staircase. If you were lucky, you had a square of, you know, like an inch of cement stair to sleep on. If, if you were particularly lucky, you might have a piece of cardboard to put on that cement. And we came down to the basement where all these women were standing shoulder to shoulder. They were bathing babies in buckets. And uh, Melanie, the nurse that we were with, told us that a lot of them were the product of rape at the border. Um, and that was the cost that the, the guards charged women to get across the border, was that they demanded sex. And it was just harrowing and devastating. And I really thought that I would, I would set a big scene of the novel there, and I just couldn't. It was, it was too overwhelming. It would have overwhelmed the entire narrative. But I think this comes back to Paolo's point earlier about specifically empathy. Um, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't tell the story because it would have overtaken the entire book. Uh, this place would have overtaken the entire book. So I looked at how I could tell one refugee story. Um, and I focused on one particular refugee, and that was Benoit, who's from the DRC, who's Zinzi, my heroine's boyfriend. And that was kind of the way that I could play in this world and try and, try and kind of tease out some of that experience. I think that there's something else also about like you find details that are really important and yet they're so big that you can't actually put them into your book. Um, I feel like I came across a lot of those at different times and some of the stuff with child soldiering where I'd read, read accounts of children who'd been through these things and, and it was like, this is too big in order to get into here. Like, and it would, it would, yeah, it would swallow the book. And, and in some cases you're also dealing with questions of, you know, the difference between fiction and nonfiction is that the fiction has this artificial sort of need to bring a reader all the way through to the end, instead of making them close the book halfway in because they're too overwhelmed. And, and nonfiction can say, here's this thing, here's where we're, we're going to report on this thing. But even, I guess, even, even in the case of, in journalism, I used to work for an environmental newspaper and we, we actually used to have people unsubscribe for a newspaper all the time because they were like, I hate seeing all the bad news. And so you see that you, you end up having to sort of select your details enough so that you can get the get some truth and not not so much that the, the reader walks away overwhelmed and never gathers any empathy, that they become swamped or something like that, and that they never never gather the story at all. Um, and that, that was something that really stood out to me, actually, with the latest book that I was working on, because, because the material was too big. Um, and it always, it always felt like you were, you were sort of wrestling with that, um, that there was, there was too much truth in the world, and then for, it, too much for your fiction, too much truth for your fiction, sort of. Yeah. Is that informing ski, uh, Seascape, the third of the Shipbreaker books? Uh, seascape, seascape. We'll see what ski, seascape. Seascape. I'm, I'm really interested in seascape as a. Um, if if shipbreaker is a place where sort of like all the all the decisions were unmade and so they sort of passively destroyed itself, and and the drowned cities is a place where where politics mangled everything and, and selfish interest uh, sort of and short sightedness mangled everything. Um, I wanted to model seascape on a, on a place that was uh, uh, seascape Boston as a place where people actually looked ahead and planned, um, but also specifically that the idea that even if Seascape Boston 
paused and looks ahead and plans, they are surrounded by people who didn't. Um, and I'm really interested in that idea of like, can you actually construct a life raft for yourself without actually engaging with the people around you who may not have life rafts? Um, and you know, this idea that, uh, and I think I think this is particularly an American consumption that like, oh, here we as the survivalists can go off and build our compound and we'll be fine and screw the rest of you. And that um, I'm really interested in ideas that, that we may succeed or fail as a society based on whether or not we pay attention to all of us as a society succeeding or failing and and that you can't simply separate yourself out and say oh no just for me I'm rich I can I can bail out of this problem um, I'm gonna be fine I can move to high high ground whatever the thing is you know and, and so um, I'm really interested in some of those questions and I always start with theme questions first and then sort of winnow down to what kinds of characters I want to play with and in, in terms of those big ideas that I'm gonna gonna work with so and Jesse, what about you? Does your research on one book lead you to the next book, or are they all kind of diverse? And uh, yeah, no, absolutely. It, in fact, uh, I'm trying to think if there have been anything I've written really that I haven't. Again, as everyone else has said, kind of things have gotten too big, or it just would kind of be a distraction. Like I'll, I have this problem where if I get interested in something, I get very, very interested in something, and so very quick something that seemed like, oh, it'd be like a neat reference. It's like, oh, well, I have to kind of explain the context for this. I have to explain the cultural factors involved in this, and the next thing I know, what was going to be a line is now a paragraph, and then a page, and then a chapter, and then its own project. Uh, a couple of specific examples, I guess, would be uh, in the Brothers Grossbarts, I originally had a jailbreak, as it were, that hinges around a hand of glory from uh, medieval Western European folklore, and I ended up cutting it for various reasons. It just, you know, wasn't working there. And then came back to that in uh, The Folly of the World, which, you know, I won't use exact example because it's kind of a spoiler. But, uh, and then that project in and of itself grew out of Enterprise. Originally in The Enterprise of Death, my second book, I was going to incorporate the St. Elizabeth Flood, which would have meant setting the book roughly 100 years earlier than I ended up setting it. But then in the course of, researching the St. Elizabeth Flood, I thought, oh, this is really neat. This could kind of be its own project. A real, really seal the deal. Uh, and this is one of the nice things about writing historical fiction. I can kind of get an idea of a plot and a rough idea of the time, but not settle on a specific date until something really jumps out that I definitely, definitely want to incorporate. So to get back to that with Enterprise, originally I was thinking I'll set it in the early 15th century when there's this catastrophic flood. But then, it, A, it started seeming a little big, you know, it was kind of taking over the project, and then B, in just researching, I saw some artwork by Nicholas Manuel Deutsch, and the artwork itself so perfectly captured the kind of atmosphere or emotion I wanted to capture with the book that I started looking into the artist. I'd never heard of him before. And as soon as I started going down the rabbit hole of Nicholas Manuel Deutsch and his life, I was like, I could totally use this guy in my book. And all of a sudden, the project went way differently from how I'd originally envisioned it. And the nice thing was I was able to do a lot of different stuff because, uh, yeah, the early 16th century was obviously very different from the early 15th century, but also give the St. Elizabeth flood the attention it deserved. You know, it really was such a rich, interesting event and, you know, what happened afterwards that I was able to write, you know, my largest novel yet all about this one event that otherwise would have been a few chapters in a different book. Do you guys do research? Do you go to the places to, to do your research? Do you visit the cities? Do you visit the locations? Yeah, I mean, it, it sort of depends on the thing. But yeah, a lot of times, I mean, for when I was doing the uh, Wind Up Girl, I was spent a bunch of time in Bangkok and then in northern Thailand and stuff like that. You just sort of needed the you sort of needed that ground for a thing in order to kind of get some physical sense of the space and in order to run into details that you wouldn't have run into otherwise that you can't, you can't get from theory or books or history or reading Thai literature or whatever, you sort of just have to be there and run into something and say, oh, this is important, I get it, and, and to, to sort of swallow up those details. Um, and in, in almost every case, it turns out that that's, that's a gift that's much bigger than you ever expect when you, before you go, um, which is really interesting to me. Yeah, I also found meeting really interesting people. Um, you know, I interviewed a cop in Chicago, and I, 
you know, just the stories he told me about working on different cases was just amazing. And, and I've actually had to keep a lot of that back for my next book. Uh, it just didn't make sense for The Shining Girls. Um, but that was really rich and really cool. And, yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. I think you have to go to the location. I think you have to explore and kind of find strange, interesting things that you wouldn't have found otherwise that, that Google Street View is just not going to give you. Yeah, and I've definitely traveled pretty much everywhere I've written about, uh, with a few exceptions. I've never gotten over to North Africa. But a part of the problem is that, you know, the stuff I'm writing is at the earliest, you know, like 500 years old. So I can be in the same place, but so little remains of what was there. But what's I found, you know, really fascinating is that it certainly seems to me, like even just being there, you are able to kind of soak things up. And, uh, yeah, as both Powell and Lauren have kind of made the point, like, being in these places not only gives you something that you'll never get from a book, but in the case of Lauren's cop example, meeting people who are really passionate, like you'll never ever find a book that is as passionate about the subject as just talking to a local who has independently, you know, apocryphally or not, soaked up so much of where they're from. So yeah, I, <laughs> I'd like to travel more to the locations I write about, but maybe my next one will be a Western or something. And where in the process do you go? So do, have you started writing and you kind of know the shape of it and then you just need to fill in the details? Or do you go first and then use that to fill in, you know, to start the process along? Lauren? I tend to start, <laughs> I tend to start with the book and the idea. And then I, I go and do the research. Um, I do a lot of kind of book research and find the things which, I, which might be potentially interesting. But, and then I go to the location, and I location scout, and I meet with as many people as I can, and this is where Twitter is so absolutely amazing, and this is why you have to get on Twitter, Jesse. Um, because, you know, I send out tweets saying, hey, I'm going to be in Chicago. Can, you know, does somebody want to show me around? Um, and I, I, I've connected with really, really interesting, amazing people. I found Joe the Cop on Twitter. I found, um, uh, a, unfortunately, a guy called Harper, at Harper, who is Harper Reed, who is Obama's social media manager, and he showed me around Chicago. And yeah, it's just been absolutely amazing. For, for me, actually, I, I like to sort of sketch out sort of like an idea of what I'm going to try to do, and I like to do a bunch of sort of um, sort of the, the academic version of the research first, and, and that gives me enough kind of uh, sort of a hooks that I can start building out. What's this character? What are some things that I think are going to happen? And then I can go to the, to the, then I can go to the location and, and that may revise everything, but I, I know it gives me sort of uh, uh, avenues of inquiry that I know, Oh, I want to be looking for these kinds of things because I think this is the direction I'm going to be going. And it sort of gives me uh, I, I need, I need at least a little bit of a mission um, and so if I go too early in that process, I, I can walk around in this very vague way, sort of being like, I know I need to absorb something. What is it? And, <laughs> and so for me, it's like if, I, if, I'm, if I'm a little further into at least a theory of what my book is going to be and what my characters are going to be and what they're going to be wanting, then once I'm in the location, then I can start like actually that, that gives me enough direction to sort of like say, oh, no, you're completely wrong this is fucked up you need to go in a different direction or oh yeah you know what you can do this will really actually add to the story and here's a detail that will do uh do a huge amount for to make this story more real more alive more more functional so it just gives you just gives you a way to sort of evaluate i guess um what which details matter um, by having that structure so uh, for me, unfortunately, it's very pragmatic. It's kind of when I can afford it. Like, I'd love to be able to visit locations before I really put anything down. We're writers. We don't need money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so obviously, and maybe it sounds kind of cheesy, but I definitely will, like, you know, find, like, National Geographic documentaries and, you know, the History Channel, as dubious a source as that is, to kind of get what I can't get from actually physically going to a space. So my last question for you all is um, whose work do you, have you ever loved somebody's work so much that you have cosplayed or written fan fiction or um, dressed up for Halloween as somebody else's characters? We were talking about this earlier via email about how um, I've seen Facebook post pictures of Jesse dressed up as Pinkie Pie from My Little Pony. And um, right. Friendship is Magic, which is actually a great show, and I think bronies have a bad rap. Um, and I actually have my, my unicorn horn for you, just for you, Jesse. Yes! <laughs> awesome! 
Such a pretty, pretty princess. Yeah, I, uh, you know, who says you can't be into, you know, necrophilic necromancer stories and also believing in the power that friendship is indeed magic? Uh, it was a uh, obstacle race, actually. It wasn't a con, but we went as a theme group, and it was a lot of fun, you know? I, uh, there, I'm trying to think of other things that I've technically cosplayed versus just Halloween costumes. One year... Um, I did Garth Marenghi. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the character. Uh, it's a very short-lived yeah, six-episode. Yeah, six-episode English uh, comedy about essentially this really terrible Dean Koontz, Stephen King sort of analog. And so it's only six episodes long, but it's really, really great if you like horror, especially cheesy 80s horror novels and horror television. Uh, it's a great parody. And also the costume is very simple. It involved, like, borrowing a jacket and a tie. Uh, I definitely, actually, even more embarrassing, perhaps, than dressing as a pink pony was Ray from uh, Akewood, which is a webcomic. And it's about talking cats and dogs, you know, anthropomorphic. The character of Ray uh, wears a thong and a gold medallion, and that's about it. So for Halloween, I made this giant paper mache cat head and then got a gold medallion and a thong, which it turns out, uh, yeah, those those are... Well, we won't even go down that road. I'll let Paolo take over, but yeah, there are probably so pictures awful. on Facebook. Yeah, no, Facebook, man, I should probably, yeah, get a Twitter and delete that account now that you should. So. <laughs> well, you so know, I, I, you go ahead, Paolo. Oh, I never, I, I've never done any cosplay or anything like that, but but it, weirdly, like, you know, the, when I was when I was really young, actually, my, the, the world that I always wanted to inhabit was Star Wars, and I always wanted to be Princess Leia. And that was that was the character that I most bonded with for some reason. I liked her hair buns or something, and I always <laughs> wanted to. Be, I always wanted to be Princess Leia. Going. Like I was like that was she. She was the character I was. I was deeply attached. Well, she was pretty badass, and I think you know, kind of um, uh, the cross the cross dressing cosplay is the most fun. Uh, you know, like seeing the Absolutely. badass like layers is just amazing. It's so exciting. Um, <laughs> I went to a con when I was 17. But I liked her before she was in the chainmail bikini. I wanted to wear the white robe and the buns. Yeah. But, but yeah, that was what I... When I was 17, I dressed up as Chitara because I basically had a leopard print sewing costume and big-ass boots. And that's what I had. But now, now I have my, my you know, unicorn horns, which I actually bought for my four-and-a-half-year-old, but her head's too small. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, they don't sell stuff at Comic-Con for kids. It's really annoying. <laughs> so I have to wear the My Little Pony t-shirt, I have to wear the unicorn horn, you know, it's, you know, I, I really That's didn't tough. buy this myself, I really didn't. Life is, <laughs> yeah, life is really hard. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you all so much. Um, just to recap really quickly, um, we've been talking with Jesse Bullington, whose most recent book is called The Folly of the World, um, and Lauren Bucus, who has um, a book called The Shining Girls coming out. Lauren, is it October? Am I right? No, it's June 4th, oh, it's one day before my birthday. June! Even better. So sooner rather than later, you can pick it up. Um, and Paolo Bacigalupi, whose most recent book is The Drowned Cities, which is the companion piece to Shipbreaker. Um, thank you all so much. This was so much fun. Thanks thank so you, much, Jen. Jen. Thank you. Thanks, guys.